everyone and welcome to this panel on the legal, financial and comparative aspects of monetary policy operations with non-banks. It has become obvious in the recent years that non-banks play an increasing role in the transmission of monetary policy. There is also substantial evidence that non-banks take a more prominent role in credit provision in Europe, but also globally. Notwithstanding its increasing importance, non-banking uh, remains largely unharmonized across the EU. And this may create challenges for all stakeholders, including the regulators. This overall trend, which probably will stay with us for many years, is not only relevant for regulators, for banking supervisors, but also for the monetary policy arms of the central banks. In addition to that growing phenomenon, the recent COVID-19 crisis taught us that non-banks also play or can also play a role in um, financial stability risks and thereby may also impact the orderly transmission of monetary policy. In such crisis periods, fire sales of assets held by these entities can lead to an impairment of the monetary policy transmission mechanism. Through the approval of the transmission protection instrument, the governing council of the ECB demonstrated the importance of an even transmission of its monetary policy throughout uh, the euro area jurisdiction. The open question remaining here is whether non-banks could be a useful channel for the monetary policy transmission in the current swing of monetary policy normalization. <clears throat> One example that immediately comes to mind in this respect is the so-called leaky floor phenomenon. Since no, non-banks have no access to the central bank's deposit storage facility, they receive a less favorable remuneration of their bank deposits than the deposit facility rate, which is offered to credit institutions. In the context of the Fed's experience, Batch and Klee showed that monetary policy normalization can potentially exacerbate this problem. Against this background, non-banks are obviously of relevance for monetary policy purposes. This was also underlined in the recent ECB strategy review conducted in 2021. The issue, however, remains that traditionally, the Eurosystem central banks interact only with credit institutions and that the Eurosystem counterparty framework has until now been designed almost exclusively for credit institutions. The general documentation sets the relevant eligibility criteria, which are all tailor-made for credit institutions and seem very difficult to reconcile with the essence of what non-banks are. At this point, you might be right to think, then what are we discussing in this panel? Here, I feel necessary to recall the recent unexpected shocks that hit European and global economies, which taught us that the monetary policy toolbox of the ECB is extremely vast. Let me just mention a few of these events, the global financial crisis and the ensuing debt crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, the increasing costs generated by global warming and Russia's unjustified aggression towards Ukraine. These events have taught us that we are facing fast evolving world, which requires constant reassessment of the economy and of market conditions, as well as readiness to pull the appropriate tool from our toolbox. Being a lawyer, I would also emphasize at this point that Article 18 of the Statute of the ESCB and ECB explicitly envisages that credit operations may be conducted with credit institutions as well as other market participants. To conclude, 
This ultimately leaves us with three questions to answer. Should access of non-banks be part of our toolbox? That's the first one. Could access of non-banks be part of our toolbox, which is the second? And third, how could access of non-banks be part of that toolbox? This is a very exciting discussion that we will be having today with our panel consisting of three very prominent speakers. Following our discussion, we'll have a Q&A session where you, you will be able to ask any questions uh, you may have. And for that reason, I would kindly ask you to raise your virtual hand in case you have a question. So without further ado, let me introduce our first panelist. Imen Rousseau Ramoni is the Director General of Market Operations at the ECB. She is in charge of implementing the single monetary policy of the euro system. Imen also sits in the BIS's Markets Committee and chairs the ECB's Market Operations Committee. She is the author of a number of articles on financial markets and monetary policy implementation, most recently on the scarcity effect of quantitative easing on repo rates, which she published in the Journal of Financial Economics. Imen will discuss the monetary and financial stability case for granting access to non-banks. In other words, she will discuss the should and also the how. Following that, we will hear Karen Shapersman, who is a prominent lawyer and the senior counsel at Clifford Chance, where she has advises on cross-border banking and investment services. Kirsten will tell us whether we actually could provide for such access by describing some of the limitations resulting from the legal requirements. Last but certainly not least, let me introduce Marco Cipriani, the head of money and payment studies at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Marco has a very extensive list of publications, which I will not cite completely here. I would only mention that he recently published an article on the money market mutual funds facility in the Fed's economic policy review. Marco will present us how the Fed has set up its overnight reverse repo facility, or on rep, as Marco will certainly refer to. So a very warm welcome to all three of you. And I will now pass the floor to Imen. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, George. And uh, thanks to you and to Chiara uh, for the invitation to this very interesting uh, conference. Yeah. So uh, I will now stop out, start actually sharing my slides. Yeah. So hopefully you can already see me and, and hear me correctly. Uh, and now I'll go into, you know, sharing a couple of slides in order to lead you through uh, the operational and uh, monetary policy considerations into the, uh, the topic of non-bank financial institutions um, access. So um, you should be seeing in a moment the nice ECB flags, the tower <laughs> and, the, uh, and, and the first page, yeah. So um, just as a uh, reminder, so the views expressed in this presentation are mine yeah, as the author and do not necessarily represent uh, the official views of the ECB. Um, so I wanted to kind of structure the presentation as follows. Yeah, uh, I think it's first important to highlight some of the most notable changes to both the ECB balance sheet and the toolkit and also the changes um, in the financial market landscape. So that's my first uh, part, yeah? And how non-banks have played, you know, as you said, uh, George, an increasing role in this landscape. Then second, uh, I'll basically explain what it means uh, that monetary policy is effectively transmitted uh, within the euro area. And I'll see how, you know, the non-bank sector fits within this concept of transmission. Then uh, I will uh, dive deeper into the why and how of uh, 
how we, we might actually provide non-banks with access to the Europe system balance sheet uh, if this were at some point um, to be decided. And then I will conclude. So starting with this, you know, shift that we've been experiencing post great financial crisis, um, it's, you know, very visible in uh, two aspects. One is central bank uh, balance sheet. Yeah. And so over the last decade, the balance sheets of major central banks have increased significantly in size. That's what you see on the slide. And um, the uh, reason uh, was to counteract the great financial crisis and then the sovereign crisis in the case of the ECB and then more recently the pandemic risks. Yeah, and this has left, you know, more and more footprints in financial market. And then in terms of how the balance sheet has expanded, because as, as you said, George, it's all about the type of operations we are running. Um, our previous short term liquidity providing uh, operations uh, have so this this, uh, you know, the, the, the blue part um, takes that into account, have been replaced by fixed rate full allotment operations and also increasingly by these longer term targeted operations, the TLT rows. Moreover, uh, the uh, big partner is our large scale asset purchase programs. Uh, you see it here in brown, which have created significant excess liquidity within the euro area. These tools were necessary. They were necessary. They were effective in enforcing the appropriate stance of monetary policy and support market functioning to safeguard the transmission of our monetary policy to the real economy and thereby to return to our inflation aim of 2%. In parallel, and that's the second part, uh, we observed a real change in the money market structure. And in particular, we observed an attrition of money markets due to structural changes imposed by regulatory reform in terms of enhanced capital requirements, new liquidity provisions, changes to the leverage ratio. And, and these constrained you know, bank balance sheets led to uh, a decrease in cross-border uh, money market activity, while at the same time, the intermediation uh, provided by central banks increased. Yeah. And so this is something we'll have to consider when we have a look at transmission. Now, in terms of non-banks, and you've said it very well in your introduction, they have played an increasing role in financial intermediation. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, it's, you know, both a question of a growing size, that growing size in European capital and financial markets. Yeah. But it's also a general move towards market based financing. So you, this is exemplified by this steady increase in the assets of uh, the non-bank financial sector on your left, with total assets of all these different subsectors more than doubling from 12 trillion to 30 trillion between 2008 and 2021. In terms of relative uh, size, relative to banks, that's the blue line, you also see that the non-bank sector is now, is now almost at par, 100% almost, with the banking sector. This importance of non-banks is reflected in their expanding role in financing the real economy that's on the right-hand side. And you see that while uh, the bank-based uh, uh, financing is still very important, actually non-financial corporations are also increasingly turning towards credit markets. So that's the blue part, the marketable debt. And the purchasing of such marketable debt by NVFIs increases their role in the financing of the real economy, but also increases really their interconnectedness with financial markets and uh, with the real economy. Yeah. So now let's have a look at, you know, transmission and how, you know, non-banks play into this. So before 2008, yeah, uh, you had in terms of transmission, what you have here on the slide, yeah. So uh, uh, we, you had, you know, our traditional uh, monetary policy counterparties, we call eligible counterparties, yeah, that um, had access. 
And uh, in a way, you see on the left hand side that uh, uh, we, as the euro system, we, uh, we, we ultimately, uh, through the transmission mechanism, reach the real economy, but we do not directly interact with the real economy. Yeah, I mean, you see uh, that there are many steps in between. Yeah, and uh, instead, this kind of, you know, uh, interaction, direct interaction is actually left to both the uh, interbank market here, which is our existing bank counterparties, and also to the, to the NBFI sector. So these two sectors interact directly with the real economy, yeah? But, but we rely on them then, on, on these uh, other sectors, uh, to do the job of interacting with the real economy. And that's what we call, you know, transmission, yeah? And so in this way, um, it's not a question of whether we should interact uh, with, with NBFIs. We are interacting already indirectly with NBFIs, but rather how directly we should interact with them, yeah? And so um, the next um, topic is about the real meaning uh, of, uh, you know, uh, balance sheet access, yeah? And maybe a better way of uh, uh, thinking um, uh, about this uh, balance sheet interaction is having the idea that uh, these uh, balance sheet access can be uh, bi-directional to some extent, yeah? Um, so basically, having shown the effect of, of all these tools on, you know, on our balance sheet, and, and here you also see how uh, this has been um, changing um, uh, in, um, with, with asset uh, purchases, yeah? Um, and, and basically, when we have added asset purchases, what, what you see uh, here in this, uh, with, with this uh, red uh, arrow is that this has added in a way, uh, and I go back to the previous slide so that you can see the difference, this has added an additional channel uh, by which we are now interacting uh, with the uh, NBFI sector. And so you see where we have represented here that there, you know, even more interaction than before uh, with the um, uh, NBFI. Uh, sector, yeah, um, and, uh, and and of course because this sector is involved in the bond market and now we are a player in the bond market, all of these interconnectedness and interactions has become even more um, important. So now let's have a look of, you know, at <clears throat> basically the why and how um, we could provide uh, if this were decided direct central bank um, uh, access to uh, NBFIs, and I, I'll start with the uh, I'll start with the asset side. Yeah, um, so the asset side would be about providing NBFIs with liquidity, providing them with with funding. Yeah, and and there. Um, uh, accessing, uh, so the asset side would be basically about uh, whether providing this access, this direct access, would help, would help preserving the transmission mechanism and mostly at times of market turmoil and, and crisis. And uh, of course, we had a recent example of that, and that was March 2020, March volatility, um, uh, market volatility linked to the COVID. And during that period, actually, investment funds and money market funds faced a significant liquidity demand shock as investors, you know, asked for redemptions and sought to liquidate their positions. As a result of this stress, NBFIs sought to offload their own holdings, yeah, in the market in order to meet these liquidity demands. And this has led to negative uh, selling spirals. The transmission and market conditions improved only through the introduction of our pandemic purchase, emergency purchase program, the PEP, yeah, uh, and other non standard monetary policy measures, and in particular the TLTRO. And the PEP was really instrumental in reviving uh, a number of market segments, and in particular the commercial paper market, and alleviating funding stress of corporates caused by fragility in money market funds. Yeah. So the necessity to enact uh, PEP uh, is is kind of you know shown here on the on the uh, right hand side. Yeah, uh, where. Um, you can see that in order to counter uh, the widespread financial shock, the euro system enacted 
a suite of easing uh, measures, including I mentioned TLTRO, but also the collateral easing measures, and um, uh, uh, but managed to uh, basically extinguish the fire there. Yeah, but the tool that really made a difference was uh, that of asset purchases uh, via the PEP. Again, this was not direct interaction with NBFIs. I mean, we purchased securities from the market, from our um, bank counterparties, but of course, uh, uh, there is an interaction in the sense that NBFIs themselves interact uh, with banks. So, um, now, let me just mention how, um, you know, a, a lending operation to a non-bank financial institution uh, would work and how it would work as a complement uh, to asset purchases. Uh, and in terms of different um, asset types, what we could consider is either a standing facility that would be used on an ongoing basis and allow NBFIs to meet uh, redemptions, or a backstop facility, which would be intended to be used only during crisis periods and when there is liquidity stress within the NBFI sector. Yeah. Um, so this is stylized on the left hand side. Um, however, and at this I wanted to mention that I'm sure it will be taken up uh, in the next presentations from the operational perspective, the granting of uh, this access on the asset side would be quite resource uh, intensive and clearly more resource intensive than the liability side access that we'll go into in a moment. Well, first of all, from a risk management uh, perspective, uh, you need to uh, ensure that lending is only provided to financially uh, sound uh, institutions and therefore, um, there, uh, you need to uh, uh, basically operationalize the performance of the regular and independent financial soundness checks. And second, from a legal standpoint, uh, certain monetary policy credit operations with non-banks seem problematic, in particular from the point of view of uh, the money market fund regulation. So now I go into the liability side, which uh, is probably a bit easier uh, and also uh, um, has uh, some justifications, as you mentioned, George, in the leaky floor uh, aspect. So um, that's exactly the leaky floor in a chart. Yeah. So if you look at uh, the chart on the um, on the left hand side, uh, what you have here is a, the behavior of money market rates in recent years. And this demonstrates very clearly when you look at what's happening with this uh, yellow line, yeah, which is the German uh, repo rate, uh, so collateralized uh, rate, um, you see actually that um, uh, while before we had, you know, uh, interest rates that were following very closely our corridor and actually uh, before in 2008, so before the financial crisis, they were even trading at the center of our interest rate corridor. Now that we have all this huge amount of excess liquidity, of course, this is uh, driving money market rates to trade at uh, the bottom of the interest rate corridor. So the deposit facility rate, which is what we call our floor. Okay. And um, and, and, and of course, very further away from uh, our ceiling, which is the marginal lending, uh, the marginal lending facility. However, uh, what we see in recent years is that the demand for liquidity by institutions has, um, you know, diminished. So by banks, yeah, and uh, and, and and basically uh, the pricing in money markets uh, has been also affected um, by other uh, sectors, including the differentiated balance sheet access uh, that you mentioned, uh, George, meaning that today, uh, while existing counterparties, so the banks can park their funds with us at the deposit facility rate, yeah, so at this uh, 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 rate uh, here uh, in blue, uh, um, actually, um, non-banks need uh, cannot do that, and therefore they need the service to be fulfilled by the market. Yeah, 
And given that banks' balance sheets have been somewhat constrained by all these regulatory uh, reforms and also the excess liquidity, we can see that uh, the, the rates that um, bank counterparties offer to non-banks are really now below the DFR, yeah? I mean, this is uh, a little bit the case for the unsecured rates so of the Euro SDR, but it's even very clearly the case for the collateralized uh, repo rate, and this is what we call the leaky floor, yeah? So such an issue um, could be problematic from a monetary policy transmission perspective, uh, especially if short-term unsecured money market rates will no longer be steered by the central bank. As such, the provision of liability side access could be seen as a way of placing a firmer floor on rates, yeah, so avoiding the leakage below the floor through the removal of differentiated access. That said, and this has been, you know, very recent experience when we uh, had lift off and increased our uh, key policy rates uh, by 50 basis points in July, we have observed a relatively successful pass-through uh, of this rate increase. Uh, and from the chart on the right-hand side, you can see that money market uh, have generally reflected in full the 50 basis points uh, hike uh, delivered. Uh, the only exception to some extent is what you see in uh, repo markets, yeah, and especially in the German repo market, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, here pictured um, actually uh, here after one month, we still don't have complete pass through. The reaction to possible future rate hikes is uncertain. However, even though there's a, a high likelihood that the pass through of policy rate hikes to money markets, uh, we think that this will continue um, to function uh, well. So now in terms of uh, the contribution to money market activity, non-banks are also uh, you know, very, um, very important participants there. And our reference rate, the Euro SDR, is a measurement of the rate at which uh, institutions trade with each other on an unsecured basis. And here it's evident that there has been on average a steady increase in the volume of trading captured by EURSDR uh, in recent years. And, um, and throughout this period, however, within the EURSDR, you had changes in patterns. So the bank to bank activity, which would have been historically a very significant part of this market, now constitutes only 10% of activity. Meanwhile, the transactions underlying EURSDR involving non-bank financial institutions that trade with banks has remained relatively stable at 70% of total. Yeah? Therefore, accessing the liability side of the central bank balance sheet may benefit transmission of monetary policy at a time of policy normalization and a time where you want basically uh, to avoid a bit this leaky floor and to have all of the market rates that follow the policy rates on an upward trajectory. Now there are a range of options in practice uh, to provide access to the liability side to uh, NBFIs. And here I just wanted to uh, mention the three we have available in the Euro system without entering into details. And I leave that for questions if some of you have questions about how this is uh, possibly done. So the first uh, possibility uh, would be the um, uh, an unsecured deposit facility. So very simply that uh, NBFIs leave money at the ECB on an unsecured basis in exactly the same way that banks do today have access to a deposit uh, facility. The second instrument would be the issuance of ECB uh, debt certificates. And these debt certificates could actually increase the universe of safe assets available within the financial system. That would be an added benefit. And um, they could be readily available to a broad set of counterparties, including NBFIs. Yeah? Um, and, um, what is interesting with ECB debt certificates is that uh, this option is already specified in our general documentation. Uh, and so, yeah, it would be a matter of, you know, using it in practice. 
And then uh, also specified uh, in, um, in our general documentation already is the possibility to conduct uh, reverse repo operations. And this would actually be quite similar to what uh, the, uh, the Fed does, yeah, with the overnight uh, RRP that I'm sure will be mentioned in the next presentations, yeah. Uh, so that would be our third option there, yeah. So now concluding, uh, and uh, I quickly summarize. First, it's clear that non banks uh, are basically playing an increasing role in our financial system, and there's nothing to suggest that this trend will not uh, continue and possibly expand. As a consequence, it's likely that um, uh, the considerations in relation to their potential direct access to the balance sheet will persist for some time. And the main question uh, is, of course, how high is the risk uh, of incomplete transmission uh, of monetary policy if NBFIs continue to grow in importance? Next, uh, when you look at liability side versus asset side, um, it seems uh, that uh, the case for the liability side access, so the transmission of monetary policy, avoiding the leaky floor and so on, is a bit more compelling today uh, than the uh, case for the asset side um, access, yeah? And that's in particular because asset side access um, uh, has a lot of complications, as I said, but also that in crisis times, we have always been able to, to actually solve the problem uh, by using instruments that are market-based. So, for example, asset purchases are market-based, but they do not require to interact directly with non-banks, yeah? Uh, and, of course, uh, for any potential access, uh, uh, either on the liability side or on the asset side, uh, the, we would need a proportionality uh, test and further analysis under different scenarios. And finally, to conclude, and this is just a reminder, um, um, for all these discussions, I think the really basic uh, premise is always the monetary policy case. It's the prerequisite for any of these discussions about potential direct access uh, of NBFIs to the central bank balance sheet. And this case should be assessed in a granular uh, way, uh, meaning by looking at, at the case of every uh, specific NBFI uh, sector. And I will stop here and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Iman. This was a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I will now hand over to, to Kerstin, who will present some of the legal aspects. Thanks very much, Gergi. Hello, everyone. And um, thanks also for giving me the opportunity to contribute to this great event. Yes, uh, as we have just heard, um, Non-bank lenders have been on the rise, not only recently, with a large part of financial assets held by non-banks, which can lead to disruptions in the financial markets in times of stress. This in turn raises the question how central banks and the euro system in particular should uh, position themselves to ensure the effectiveness of monetary policy operations in light of this changing environment. So we have now um, just now looked at the why and how of direct balance sheet access from a macroeconomic perspective. And I'm going to talk about um, to what extent an intervention of central banks could be permitted from a legal perspective under existing rules applicable to non-banks or whether, um, as we think, uh, legislative action might be required to allow central bank interaction with these market participants. So, um, George has already outlined some of the limitations for the euro system arising from the fact that the general documentation stipulates eligibility criteria, which are, which are all tailor-made for credit institutions. On my end, I wanted to focus on the legal considerations um, from the perspective of a particular subgroup of non-banks, namely money market funds. Um, and that because MMFs were among the non-banks which were particularly affected by events such as the global financial crisis um, and more recently the market disruptions resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic and because MMFs are subject to a set of rules and regulations that poses challenges for central bank funding. <clears throat> 
Um, as an alternative to bank deposits and an important source of corporate and government financing because they offer diversification of investments, instantaneous liquidity and relative stability of value, MMFs are closely linked to the banking sector. And as a result, um, runs on funds in the form of high level redemptions by investors and MMFs when combined with a lack of liquidity in private money markets in a financial crisis can have consequences not only on the functioning of the money markets, but also in the worst case on the real economy. So in the EU, um, MMFs are subject to restrictions in their operations since the enactment of the money market funds regulation in 2018, rules that were introduced as a consequence of lessons learned from the global financial crisis to make MMFs more stable and less vulnerable to runs. So before turning to specific provisions of the MMF regulation that are relevant in the context of their ability to be a counterparty to central bank monetary policy operations. Uh, for some background, I wanted to just very briefly describe the main features of MMFs and their regulatory framework. So an MMF must be authorized as such under the MMF regulation and must be a collective investment undertaking that fulfills three requirements. One, it is a use its fund or an alternative investment fund under the AFMD. Two, it invests in short term assets with residual maturities of less than two years. And three, it has distinct or cumulative objectives offering returns in line with money market rates or preserving the value of the investment. And MMF may be set up as one of three types depending on its investments, so whether those are public debt or other assets, and whether the fund's net asset value is stable or variable. Its legal form ultimately depends on the applicable national law, but under the regulation the fund can, for example, be a fund constituted in accordance with contract law, so a common fund managed by a management company. It can also be set up in accordance with trust law, um, or in accordance with statute as an investment company. And if an FMM, MMF uh, comprises more than one investment compartment, each compartment is regarded as a separate MMF for the purposes of the activities that I'm taking a closer look at in this panel. Um, the MMF regulation sets out rules for the operation of MMFs. This applies in particular on the composition of the portfolio. MMFs may only invest in predefined eligible assets, um, which will become relevant uh, later on. Um, those assets uh, comprise money market instruments, ABCP, deposits with credit institutions, repos and reverse repos, and some other assets. All of those investments are subject to strict diversification requirements and concentration limits. Like other financial counterparties, MMFs are subject to AML requirements and must have a prudent and documented internal credit quality assessment procedure, as well as sound and prudent know your customer procedures to help understand their investor base and large uh, anticipate large redemption, redemptions. MMFs are also subject to maturity limitations in the form of a maximum allowable weighted average maturity and weighted average life, and they must hold a minimum amount of liquid assets that mature daily or weekly on an ongoing basis to strengthen their ability to face redemptions and prevent their assets from being liquidated at heavily discounted prices. MMFs must also conduct stress testing at regular intervals as part of prudent risk management and um, competent authorities have supervisory invest and investigatory powers to verify compliance with the MMF regulation. Now, to the interesting part, now, how can restrictions that apply to MMFs under the MMF regulation be reconciled with the ECB's monetary toolbox? Again, um, the general framework, uh, George, you mentioned that until now has been designed for banks and although um, the statute of the ECB and the EC ESCB and the ECB expressly permit the conduct of credit operations not only with credit institutions but also other market participants and MMFs as just shown are subject to a set of regulatory rules. These are distinct from those applicable to credit institutions and the current framework would 
obviously require changes in order to be workable for them if justified from a policy perspective. In any event, fitting non-banks in the form of MMFs under the monetary policy framework is only one side of the coin. The other side is whether the rules of the MMF regulation themselves would allow the participation of MMFs in, the mon in monetary policy operations. To try and answer this question, I'm going to look at three specific aspects of the money market funds regulation. The first one, that I wanted to look at is a general principle that would be relevant independent of the specific monetary policy tool that is used and is enshrined in Article 35 of the regulation, namely a general prohibition of external support for MMFs. So what does external support mean in this context? Uh, in this context? The MMF regulation defines this as any direct or indirect support offered to an MMF by a third party, including a sponsor of the MMF that is intended for or in effect would result in guaranteeing the liquidity of the MMF or stabilizing the NAV per unit or share of the MMF. So the reason for such prohibition being that providing support for an MMF with a view to maintaining liquidity or stability or de facto having such effects increases the contagion risks between the MMF sector and the rest of the financial sector. The question is then how the reference to third party is to be understood. Looking at the wording in the first place, as lawyers tend to do, this could refer to any person and as a result also include the euro system. But if one takes into account the historical context and looks at the MMF regulation proposals and impact assessments, it must be noted that external support from third parties was discussed under the term sponsor support. The MMF regulation does not offer an express definition of that term, but the legislative materials identify two types of sponsors, an asset manager of the MMF and the financial institution which offers or originates the MMF. So if the euro system was to undertake monetary policy operations with MMFs, its intention would certainly be to maintain liquidity and stability of MMFs. So one could say that this corresponds with the definition of external support. But this support would, I think, not necessarily be given on an individual basis, as would be the case for a sponsor who is an affiliate or entity involved in the setting up of the fund and has a very distinct economic or reputational reason to provide support. This, in my view, would be different for the euro system, which is guided by monetary policy and systemic stability considerations and under its framework treats all eligible participants equally once their eligibility has been determined. Also, if we look at the list in the MMF regulation as to what constitutes external support, examples are cash injections from a third party or the purchase by a third party of assets of the MMF at an inflated price. These examples imply that support entails a certain non-market element. Um, and I would also note the following. In the context of the difficulties faced by certain MMFs during the COVID crisis in March 2020, when measures of central banks, such as the purchase of CP, intermediated by credit institutions, indirectly also benefited MMFs, um, ESMA issued a statement aimed at clarifying the potential interaction between such intermediation and the requirements of Article 35 of the MMF regulation. And in this statement, ESMA specifies certain conditions under which in intermediation does not constitute external support. One of the clarifications made was that um, transactions with third parties are considered not to be carried out at an inflated price where they are executed at arm's length conditions, which uh, kind of seems obvious. The other clarification relates to the circumstances in which an action by a third party has the direct or indirect objective to maintain the liquidity profile and the NAV per unit or share of the MMF, where ESMA points out that such indication is given where third parties execute transactions solely 
with the MMFs to which they are affiliated. In the context of the ongoing consultation of the MMF regulation, it has now been proposed that these clarifications be made in the level one text. So on that basis, I believe that the argument can be made that monetary policy operations by the euro system with MMFs on standard tender procedures at conditions which are available to all elig eligible counterparties participating in the operations should not qualify as support within the meaning of the MMF regulation. The second specific aspect that is worth looking at in the context of monetary operations with MMFs are deposits, namely whether MMFs could benefit from a deposit facility, which can be used by eligible participants to make overnight deposits with the euro system for the absorption of excess liquidity. A deposit that is eligible for investment by MMFs must fulfill three requirements, namely one, it is repayable on demand or is able to be withdrawn at any time. Two, it matures in no more than 12 months. Um, and three, it is with a credit institution in a member state or in a third country where institutions are subject to equivalent prudential rules. While the first two requirements seem achievable by designing the terms of the instruments accordingly, the more interesting question is whether the euro system could be considered as a credit institution as that term is used in the MMF regulation. The regulation refers back to the CRR, which defines, as we know, a credit institution as an undertaking the business of which is to take deposits or other repayable funds from the public and to grant credit for its own account. Now, on the one hand, under the statute of the ESCB, the ECB and the NCB's open accounts for credit institutions, public entities and other market participants and accept assets as collateral and as such could be seen to be taking funds from the public. As an EBA opinion of 2020 has shown, it's not a term that is conclusively defined in European law and can be construed to refer to any person other than the credit institution itself. But on the other hand, one might say that the ECB and NCBs do not undertake a business with a commercial purpose, as is commonly understood to be the case for credit institutions, um, as they are traditionally understood. Um, but it must also be noted that the Capital Requirements Directive contains an express exemption declaring the provisions of that directive um, inapplicable to central banks, as did actually already the first banking directive in 1977, which in the recital says that exceptions must be provided for in the case of certain institutions to which this directive cannot apply. So it could be concluded that the CRR definition of credit institution does not in itself exclude central banks. So um, as a result, it is at least doubtful if the wording as such prohibits a deposit by an MMF under the deposit facility as a monetary policy instrument. But it should also not be disregarded that one of the goals of the review of the MMF regulation that I mentioned earlier is um, to make MMFs more resilient to stress market conditions without the need of uh, central bank support. So ultimately, a legislative clarification might be appropriate if it is determined that a participation in monetary operations in the form of a deposit facility would be desirable, desi desirable from a policy perspective. Um, the third and last aspect that I quickly wanted to address today is a potential participation by MMFs in open market operations in the form of reverse repurchase transactions um, under which the euro system receives securities and provides liquidity to market participants. So um, from the perspective of an MMF, its participation would be in the form of a repurchase agreement, which um, as mentioned, is in principle part of the eligible transactions that an MMF is allowed to undertake if it fulfills specific conditions. Those are that it must be on a temporary basis for no more than seven working days, only for liquidity management purposes and not for investment purposes, a requirement that could be managed through the conditions specified for the um, relevant policy instrument. The next requirement is that 
the counterparty receiving assets transferred by the MMFS collateral under the repurchase agreement must be prohibited from selling, investing, pledging, or otherwise transferring those assets without the MMFS prior approval. That is obviously not something that um, the current framework provides, um, but it also does not appear to preclude that such a requirement could be implemented. So uh, this seems manageable. A further condition is that the cash received by the MMFS part of the repurchase agreement must not exceed 10% of its assets. Again, that's a requirement to be observed by the MMF manager, um, more of an internal aspect. And finally, the MMF must have the right to terminate the agreement at any time upon giving prior notice of no more than two working days. Again, the current framework doesn't specify any such right to terminate the agreement at any time, but conversely also does not per se prohibit such termination rights. So um, it would be a question of whether implementing uh, the implementing documentation can accommodate this. So on those points, in summary, it appears possible in principle to design open market operations in the form of MROs to meet the requirement uh, for repurchase agreements under the MMF regulation. So um, by way of conclusion, while it doesn't seem that central bank support for non-banks in the form of MMF would have to be ruled out completely from a purely legal perspective, there are some challenges and uncertainties um, in the interpretation of existing provisions, um, also, um, borrowing and lending of MMFs um, against collateral is prohibited at the moment under the MMF regulation. Um, and in a number of areas, I think on that basis, legislative intervention would be preferable to enhance legal certainty and to make potential measures less vulnerable to challenge. Um, again, taking into account that post-COVID crisis assessments, including in the context of the consultation on the MMF regulation, has focused on enhancing MMF resilience and ensuring that they can operate without impacting financial stability, regardless of the market conditions, and uh, also to avoid intervention of central banks. So even if we could put the legal piece of the puzzle in the right place, it's only part of the whole picture. And um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand over back to Yogi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. This was very, very interesting. Um, we are slightly running uh, behind of time. Um, so I, I, without further ado, I will pass uh, the mic to Marco. Marco, the floor is yours. I, um, I have to be given authority to share my screen, which I don't have now. Okay, so thank you very much for having me here. Um, this uh, presentation is about the overnight reverse uh, uh, repo facility, which is uh, a facility set in place uh, by the Federal Reserve uh, to support monetary policy. It's work that myself and a colleague of mine, Gabriele Raspada, are currently conducting. Uh, whatever I'm presenting does not, of course, reflect the opinion of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or of the Federal Reserve System in general. The building in the slide, I hope you see, is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's a copy of a very famous building in Florence, uh, so I hope that sets the discussion in a, in a, in, in a good way. So I will, I will start by giving an outline of the presentation. I will talk about how the Federal Reserve implemented monetary policy before 2008, how the implementation of monetary policy changed after 2008, what is the role of the overnight reverse repo facility in the in monetary policy implementation framework? And then I will conclude with some other policy considerations. First of all, how does the Federal Reserve communicate the stance of monetary policy? It does so by setting a target for the federal funds rate. It used to be a numeric target now it's a target range, but not doesn't matter so much. And what is the federal fund rate? Is the rate that prevails in the federal funds market. And the federal funds market is the market where the federal funds are traded. Federal funds are uncollateralized loans by institutions that have an account with the Federal Reserve. 
Now it's very important that there are two types of such institutions that have an account at the Federal Reserve, it's two main types, and there are several others. One is depository institutions, that is banks, be them domestic or foreign. And then there are government sponsored enterprises, which are quasi governmental organizations that have been set up by the US government so to support the flow of credit to certain segments of the new US economy. Of particular importance, because they have been particularly active as of recent in the federal funds market, is federal home loan banks. Now, before 2008, the Federal Reserve implemented monetary policy through a so-called corridor system. What does that mean? There was reserve scarcity, that is, reserve were at a level which was just enough for banks to satisfy their liquidity needs and the reserve requirements that we used to impose. Reserves did not pay any interest. Therefore, banks did not have an incentive to hold reserves in excess of what they needed. Therefore, they traded reserves in the federal funds market, and the prevailing rate was the trade rate that the Federal Reserve would target. And the Federal Reserve would adjust the supply of reserves so that the prevailing rate would be close to its own target. Now, this, cha this changed after 2008. The level of reserves in the system ballooned because the Federal Reserves, as many other central banks in Europe, conducted large-scale asset purchases. And therefore, it became difficult to conduct monetary policy and to achieve a target for the federal fund rate through reserve scarcity. However, in 2008, the Fed had received the authority from Congress to pay interest on reserve balances held by domestic or foreign banks. And of course, this interest rate, which changed the name throughout the years, but I will call the interest on reserve balances or IORB, would set the floor below any bank who would be unwilling to lend. There is no reason for a bank to lend below IORB if it can get the same amount of interest by simply keeping the money as reserves. And therefore, the Federal Reserve used and uses the IRB to keep the federal funds rate within its target. So if uh, this chart it kind of characterized the change in monetary policy implementation, on the x-axis, you have the amount of reserves. On the y-axis, you have the interest rate. The blue line represents the demand of reserves that they can come from liquidity needs of bank, they need to satisfy a regulatory ratio, they need to keep a reserve requirement, you name it. Now, when there is a little amount of reserves, when reserves are scarce in the chart, that line will be downward sloping. That is, by adjusting the amount of reserves in the system, the Federal Reserve can keep the rate in the federal fund market on target. However, if you have so many reserves that that line becomes flat because banks have more reserves than they need, the only way the Federal Reserve can keep the interest rate, the federal fund rate, close to the target is through setting the interest rate that banks are paid on reserve, the IRB. And that was the, has been the way in which the Federal Reserve has implemented monetary policy since 2008. And overall, it has worked reasonably well. The gray area in this chart represents the target range. The red line represents the interest that we set, the interest on reserve balance is an administrative rate set by the Federal Reserve. And the blue line represents the effective federal fund rate, which is the measure of the rate at which transactions happen in the federal fund market. And as you can see, they track each other, both when rates are low and when rates go up and when rates go down. They track each other. However, you can see that almost always the blue line is below the red line which is a little bit the leaky floor 
that was mentioned below. And why is the blue line below the red line? That is, why doesn't it hover around the red line or wasn't it is actually always on top of the red line since the red line is the interest rate that the Fed pays on reserve balances? The reason is that there are, as I mentioned before, institutions that trade Fed, fund Fed funds contract, which are not depository institutions. The most important of these institutions nowadays are federal home loan banks. Because these institutions don't have access to the IRB, they may trade at rates which is below the IRB rate. So a way of solving this problem, this problem of a leaky floor, would be just to allow this institution to earn an interest rate at the Federal Reserve. And this is exactly what the ONAN RRP, the Overnight Reverse Repo Facility, does. It allows eligible institution to place money, that is to invest if you want, overnight with the Federal Reserve at the fixed rate, the own RRP offering rate, which is determined by the Federal Reserve itself. Who are the eligible counterparties? There are depository institutions, but there are also non-bank financial institutions, like money market funds, FHLBs, which are the institutions that trade in the federal funds market, and other government-sponsored enterprises, that is, other entities sponsored by the US government that have ac access to a Fed account. The investment take the form of a reverse repo transaction collateralized by US treasuries. Now, by allowing non-bank institutions to invest in the Federal Reserve at the fixed rate, the ONRRP provides a soft floor, if you want, for the Federal Funds rate and for short-term rates in general. And that floor, it works really well, as, as I will see in a second. Now, what is the legal authority for us to do that? There is a section of the Federal Reserve Act that allows each Federal Reserve Bank to buy and sell basically US treasuries. This is a long way of saying that in accordance to the rule and regulation prescribed by the Board of Governor of the Federal Reserve System. Because the repo transaction is the agreement to buy a security with the agreement to resell the security, it falls within the scope of this act. Some characteristics about the ONAN RRP, it's run daily at 12.45 for half an hour. There is an aggregate limit, and we will discuss a little bit the rationale for that at the end, which is all the treasuries held or tried by the New York Fed. There is also a counterparty limit, which is 160 billion. It has been raised over time throughout the life of this facility, and settlement is not bilateral, it happens on the tripartite repo platform. The overnight reverse repo facility was proposed by a Federal Reserve staff in July 2013. There was a period in which we texted it. It was a very fascinating time. We texted it in a way in which science text, uh, test a facility. We just changed the rate of the facility, a very small rate, to see the impact it had on uh, the activity in the federal fund market. And in 2014, the Federal Reserve issued a statement saying that it would intend to use the overnight reverse repo facility in addition to the ERP to help control the federal funds rate. And this is the monetary policy implementation framework that we have now. Let me show it with a chart. This is very similar to the chart we had before. On the horizontal line, you have the quantity of reserves. On the vertical line, you have the rates. On the top is the discount window rate, which is the rate at which bank can borrow from us. On the bottom, you have the IRB rate, which is the rate that we pay to banks. And below that, you have the ONAN RRP rate, which is the rate that the ONAN RRP pays to ONAN RRP counterparties. As you see, the FFR 
lies usually below these two rates independently of the supply of reserves because the supply of reserve is large enough that we hit the demand of reserve curves in its horizontal segment. How did it work? It worked reasonably well. This is the same slide as before. You can see the red line as before is the interest we pay on reserves to bank. The gray area is our target range. The um, red line is the overnight reverse repo facility rate. And the blue line is the effective federal funds rate, which is a measure of federal funds rate activity in the market, you see that the yellow line acts as a very good floor for the on RRP rate. This is his take up of the facility. We'll discuss this a little bit at the end. Take up was that is how much institution invested in the facility was relatively large at the beginning of the facility. Then as the Fed started contracting its balance sheet as part of the normalization process between the end of 2017 until 2019, the use of the facility went basically to zero. And then it ballooned again uh, during the COVID-2020 uh, pandemic because the Federal Reserve again expanded its balance sheet to meet uh, the issue uh, caused by COVID. Now, uh, the on RRP is not the only instance in which Fed, the Federal Reserve interacts with money market funds. For instance, in March 2020, the Federal Reserve established a money market funds liquidity facility to help redemption during the March 20 run. Through this facility, the Federal Reserve made loans available to banks so that they could purchase MMF assets. So this is exactly the opposite kind of facility. With the ONRP, funds place cash with us. With MMLF, we helped funds meet their redemptions, okay? That is, the purpose of the MMLF was not monetary policy implementation, was to support the flow of credit to household and business by supporting money market funds. If you want, it's a credit facility. And there is also a difference in the way in which this facility were set up. Whereas with an RRP, the Federal Reserve transacts with money market funds. With MMLF, the Federal Reserve made loans to bank to purchase assets from, MMLF, from, from money market funds. That is, the interaction with money from market funds was much more indirect. They were also established by, through very different segment of the Federal Reserve Act. So I would like to finish the presentation, the last remaining slides, by going through some policy consideration related to the setting up of the on RRP. The first is what is the, its impact on reserves? So when a money market fund, let's use the money market fund as an example because they are the largest user of the facility, invest in the on RRP, it basically places money with the Federal Reserves. How does it do so? By reducing the money it holds with its custodian bank. Therefore, that bank will hold lower reserve balances at the Federal Reserve. Let's make an example. Let's say money market funds invest $100 in the on RRP. The impact on the Federal Reserve balance sheet will be the following. Reserves will go down by $100 and on an RRP in our balance sheet will go up by $100. That is one of the impact of the on an RRP, one of the effect of an RRP is that it allows for Federal Reserve liability to be held by a more varied set of institutions, not only depository institutions, but also, for instance, money market funds. This is particularly important in times of stress when the Federal Reserve, as it was the COVID-19 pandemic, may want to stimulate the economy by expanding its balance sheet. If the ONRP did not exist, the only way to do that 
would be to increase in reserves by depository institution, which would may put pressures on banks to balance sheet themselves. As banks have lots of reason why they may not want to hold too large an amount of reserves. The NRP allows the Federal Reserve to expand its balance sheet through a wider set of institutions. So let's make an example. Let's say the, the Federal Reserve wants to increase its balance sheet by $100 by buying $100 worth of treasuries. On our asset side of our balance sheet, treasury will go up by $100. Normally, we would conduct an operation. We would sell a treasury and we will buy a treasury from a bank and reserves would go up by $100. But through the NRP, we can spread, if you want, the effect of this increase in $100 worth of asset by having the reserve go up only by a portion of that and part of the take up being done by money market funds. And of course, the on an RP rate will be a rate that will determine ultimately the ratio between the amount of our balance sheet, which is held by depository institutions, and the amount of our balance sheet, which is held by money market funds and other institutions. I will finish with two slides. One has to do with financial intermediation and the other one with financial stability. One concern when the NRP was initially set up was that it could crowd out private financing. Why? Money market fund, instead of investing directly with, uh, with uh, in investing with private institution, now have the option of investing directly with the Federal Reserve. And they just may avail themselves of, of that option and get a headache less for, for them. Like it's much easier to invest with us than to invest with the private sector. In these, if you see in this chart, this chart shows from 2013 to 2021, uh, the uh, repo investment by US money market funds. The red line is private repo, and the blue area is on, an, on RRP repos by money market funds. You see what happens with the COVID pandemic in 2020. The take up by money market fund of the NRP went up dramatically, but at the same time, they reduced their take up of private repos. This is exactly the concern that people had in mind. However, one has to bear in mind that the, Fed, the NRP does not change the size of the Fed balance sheet. So much of this increase in take up may simply represent a reduction in MMF lending to bank which in turn hold less reserves. So its impact um, for the real economy may be less than this picture seems to suggest. Another concern is the impact on financial stability. And here the impact can go on both ways. On the one hand, the ONRRP is a liability by the Federal Reserves that is money-like, has a feature like repos of a money asset. As such, it may displace private money creation by non-bank financial institutions. And we generally think this is a good thing as non-bank financial institutions are inherently run runnable. So there, is a, there may be a, a financial stability benefit in having this facility set up. On the other hand, people were concerned that the availability of a safe option for money market fund could increase the likelihood of uh, a bank run. That is, the money market funds could withdraw in mass from a bank and precipitate a, a, a run on the bank on which the money market fund is investing. And this is the reason why the Federal Reserve established all those caps I mentioned at the beginning. I want to just mention that this concern has not materialized during the pandemic. Let me finish up. Uh, the on an RP, the overnight reverse repo facility, together with the interest on the reserve balance, allows the Federal Reserve to maintain control over short term money market rates in an environment in which reserves are no longer scarce as they were before 2008. It also increases, and this is an important feature of this facility, the set of institutions that can hold Federal Reserve liabilities diminishing the pressure on banks when the Federal Reserve expands its balance sheet.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, so we will now have a Q and A session. Um, as I as I said during my introduction, please raise your hand and please also indicate uh, to whom your um, question is uh, directed at. Um, in the meantime, I would already have a few questions for 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 our panelists, and maybe first to uh, to Iman and and Marco. So I saw in Iman's presentation that the the recent uh, rate hike uh, in the in the eurozone was quite uh, closely translated into money market rates. Uh, I mean, this is just an example, and it's a recent example. So I think we need some background to be able to properly assess this phenomenon. Um, but but would you say that there is a difference in in between the US and and Europe in that respect, or is it too early to to judge? That's that's one question I have uh, to to both of you. And then uh, I have two questions to to Kerstin. Um, the first one is um, about uh, the definition of credit institutions. Uh, and you mentioned this, this EBA report, um, which I also read. And there it seems that a number of member states um, have uh, clarified that uh, deposit taking from other financial institutions, uh, including credit institutions, do not or does not constitute um deposit taking from the public so this this would not fly under the under the definition of of credit institutions that's the first one the second one is when you mentioned this um, arm's length uh, basis that we would contract with with money market funds and there i think i, I have a, a more general question on equal treatment so when you look at what we have currently as requirements for, for our counterparties to meet, uh, one of them is to be subject to minimum reserves. And as you know, the, the, the statute of the ECB and ESCB only allows the ECB to subject uh, credit institutions to minimum reserves. So by definition, we would need to lift uh, that requirement. The same applies to uh, supervision because most of these institutions are not uh, prudentially supervised. The same applies actually also to financial summons because these institutions do not have to meet on funds requirements. So when you speak about arm's length transactions, I was a bit um, surprised because we would have to set up a brand new framework with very derogatory conditions if we wanted to allow these, uh, these institutions to come into, the, into our system. So uh, these are my two questions to you, and uh, and uh, I will stop here. Thank you. So do you want me to go ahead, uh, George? Yes, please, Iman. Yes, thank you. So I mean, I think the pass through um, <clears throat> the pass through in the in in the euro system, I think, is not. I mean, the question of pass through is not very different uh, in the euro area and in the US. I mean, the difference clearly is that in the US, there is the overnight you know, RRP uh, facility in place, uh, as Marco explained very well, yeah. Uh, and, and we don't have that, yeah. So on, in our case, what happens is that um, in the repo market in particular, um, you, you do see uh, an incomplete pass-through, yeah. Uh, because uh, those institutions that have a preference to, um, to to basically transact on a collateralized basis, yeah, to leave deposits collateralized, yeah, uh, uh, basically their only option is to go to the banks. And because the, there are, there's a kind of double phenomenon whereby the banks are awash with liquidity because of all this excess liquidity we created and therefore especially at period ends but also uh, outside of quarter ends and year end uh, they are not very happy to accept this liquidity okay and in our in and in our system contrary to the fed uh, the banks are the only ones who can hold this excess liquidity because we don't have this overnight rrp huh? 
So first of all, they're not very happy to accept it. So basically, they 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 propose rates that are not very favorable. Yeah. And the second thing is that we also experience in our market um, collateral scarcity, in particular on uh, German French securities. So those securities that are the most uh, uh, liquid and credit worthy. And the reason for this is we you know we do have this uh, this diff. Well, first of all, the QE has you know, uh, taking a lot of securities out of the market. I think this is common with all the major central banks. Yeah, so we, we hold um, a significant portion of the debt now. Uh, and we do have a securities lending facility that allows to put the securities back into the market, but somehow it is underused. Yeah, I mean, we're still looking at why, but but clearly uh, it's uh, it doesn't... Um, it, uh, it doesn't um, completely uh, mitigate the scarcity that we have on um, on on uh, the core markets. And the other reason is that indeed we have this, you know, um, uh, segmentation of bond markets in the euro area across jurisdictions, and therefore uh, some jurisdictions feel the pressure on scarcity more than others. Yeah. Um, so long story short. What happens is this ripple market is is a bit under pressure uh, uh, in the system we have today, and and therefore we see rates that are uh, sometimes, especially at period and significantly below, you know, uh, the deposit facility uh, rate. Um, I mean, I'd be interested uh, if Marco, if there's something similar in the U.S. But my 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 guess is that the overnight RRP actually mitigates a lot of this. Yeah. Then the the phenomenon that may be a bit common is maybe the pass through to uh, the Treasury bill market. So this I haven't mentioned because it's you know it's it's kind of. Uh, uh, not not the main part of what we look at when we talk of pass through, but um, we we also are seeing uh, a lot of demand for these uh, treasury bills, and therefore uh, the the rates are also um, somehow below uh, the deposit facility rate. Yeah, and I think this is also a manifestation of scarcity, the same collateral scarcity, uh, but uh, for uh, short term uh, uh, government uh, securities. And and I think this the, in in the US there's the same. Also because uh, you know uh, in a way the demand does not always the trend in demand. Uh, does not always meet the trend in supply, yeah, because governments may choose that they want to issue less uh, T-bills exactly at the moment where investors would like to buy more T-bills, yeah. Do you want me to continue? So I, I think Iman exactly explained the case of the United States in the correct way, in the sense that the purpose of the NRP was to make sure that we would be able to implement monetary policy, by which we mean keeping the effective funds rate on target. Okay. However, the counterparty at the NRP are not only those institutions that are active in the federal funds market. They are not only banks and GSEs. There are other institutions that have a much bigger imprint in the economy and that are active in other markets, like exactly as the man said, in the repo market. So by allowing institutions which do not trade in Fed funds access to the NRP, the facility supported money market rate in general. For instance, money market funds are very active in the euro dollar market, which has been supported by the facility, or by the, the repo market, which Iman uh, um, mentioned before. Now, if we go a step forward, however, the level of the press through is very heterogeneous across institutions. For instance, the press through of rate increases in, by in CDs is very different from that in money market share yields. They, they are very, very different. Additionally, some work that Gabriella and I have done it, there is a difference even between the pass through to retail investors within the money market fund industry 
and institutional investors within the money market fund industry. So when we move one step away from the institution and directly uh, interact with the Federal Reserve or with the European Central Bank, then we see much more heterogeneity in pass through according to the institutional the type of contract we are looking at. Thank you. Thank you to both. And then uh, I'll, I'll leave the floor to, to Kerstin. Thanks. Um... Maybe first, uh, so to your first uh, question um, on the definition of credit institutions, I mean, obviously, um, this this question is probably bigger than just looking at the the money market fund regulation and has a lot of a lot of other um, impacts. I mean, with uh, and I agree with you with uh, sort of with my but with my my German uh, sort of law glasses on. Um, credit institutions taking funds from other credit institutions would not fall within the definition, but credit institutions um, taking funds from other market participants, including funds, um, would still be seen to be taking, at least from a German perspective and licensing perspective, funds from the public. Um, and I mean, as I said, I think um, the the w relying just on that interpretation is probably a bit bold in the circumstances um, and um, a clarification um, that money market funds could actually use a deposit facility would would certainly be um, appropriate. Um, on on the second point, um, I mean, the, the way that I think arm's length business was to be understood is very much in contrast to um, sort of transactions with affiliates and um, hence at conditions which one might not be um, willing to give to unrelated parties. I mean, I, I also um, realize that if the euro system wanted to include uh, MMFs in the money market, uh, sorry, in the um, in the monetary policy operations, you would need to come up with a whole different set of um, entrance criteria um, because mirroring what is available for credit institution would, would probably be difficult. Thank you. Um, we have one minute left. Maybe we still have time for a, a very last question. Um, so I see that um, Lamprini Ziaka wants to ask a, a question. I understand the the whole process takes a bit of uh, of time um, while she's allowed to to speak. Um, but but bear with us for a second and, and she uh, she already appeared on screen so she'll be with us in in, in a moment can you hear me now yes you can hear yes. Yes. right uh first of all many thanks to everyone it was a uh, very interesting uh there were all the presentations very interesting i would have a question to kirsten um and um, I would like to know, you referred to, uh, in, your, in your presentation to the fact that the MFFs uh, can take different legal forms depending on national law. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was wondering whether you can specify uh, or elaborate, um, uh, elaborate a bit further uh, about this, for instance, if uh, in case we have, uh, um, let's say, an MMF that, uh, that does not have a legal personality, uh, whether it is could, for instance, uh, uh, be overcome uh, or, or whether you see issues with uh, uh, in this context. Thank you. I realized my camera was not on. Uh, apologies for that. <laughs> I hope you no can problems. see it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of the different forms that MMFs can take is, I think that comes from, from the way funds are typically set up as um, in, in, for example, German funds as a, a contractual fund with separate uh, compartments of assets. Um, I mean, for the purposes of uh, in transacting in in the the normal course, each uh, sort of compartment compartmentalized fund would enter um, would be seen as a separate, uh, not a separate legal entity, obviously, but um, transactions would be um, sort of allocated to the different compartments. I think that is 
one of the challenges um, when thinking about a sort of entrance criteria for funds, how one would um, overcome the fact that you're not looking in all cases at a at a separate legal entity. I don't think I have the um, the fantastic solution <laughs> at hand right now, but um, I, to me that is a question to be addressed in the um, in the entrance criteria. Many many thanks. Yes, indeed, it sounds uh, legally also challenging from a lot of different perspectives. But uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> here we are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the experts. Exactly. Okay. Um, so thank you, thank you very much to the to the panelists. Also, thank you to the to the audience. This panel is now uh, closed. The next the next panel will start at four, uh, and the title is towards legal interoperability of retail central bank digital currencies, a comparative law perspective. Thank you to all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.